Ladies and gentlemen, there are many but related definitions of sustainability, one of which is sustainability refers to how biological systems remain diverse and productive. If we apply the same to engineering education, we perhaps get the gist of the discussion I will present today. I would like to start by briefly presenting some international engineering curricula programming differences and at the same time unifying the issues raised by UNESCO, the leading sponsor for this conference. An interesting engineering, engineering curricula notion was presented by MIT. Together with some Swedish universities, Chalmers, Chalmers Linkoping and the Royal Institute of Technology, the groups founded CDIO. The initialism represents conceive, design, implement and operate. On a higher level, CDIO can be used to differentiate our academic programs in South Africa. One could argue and say that the engineering science qualification tilts more towards the left, towards conceive and design, whereas the technician qualification tilts more towards the right, towards implement, towards operate. The proposed VNG tech sits somewhere in between, in between meaning, design and implement. Internationally, via the Accords, Washington, Dublin and Sydney, programs in South Africa receive international recognition Respectively, the Accords aligned to the Washington Accord for Engineers, the Dublin Accord for Technicians, and Sydney Accord for Technologists. The European higher education area follows a separate notion. In other words, the Bologna process, initiated by the University of Bologna in 1999. The ECTS credits are differently defined, however, the credits are typically 60 per year, computing to approximately 1,500 to 1,800 hours. This is, of course, different to the credit system in South Africa. There is also another related accord, the Steel Accord, which aligns to the field of computing. Currently, some work is ongoing in South Africa towards developing a signatory member to this accord. With the continuous changes in landscape among universities, it's of interest to take note of events such as the one hosted by the South African Society for Engineering Education in June 2014. At the same time, industry advisory boards of faculties and academic departments seek a closer alignment to the ever-changing needs of the industry or the so-called real world. This is of course a challenge, a diversity of industries exist and for this reason most academic institutions, at least for the first qualification, propose a generalist approach rather than a specialist approach. The latter is perhaps more applicable to the technology programs. One could then draw an analogy between academia and a marathon, whereas perhaps the industrial demand is more of sprinting. A difference, as you can imagine, is that in academia you publish or perish, whereas in some industries you publish and perish. So, what does the South African government say? Well, the Gazette of May 2014 provides the scarce skills list. The list is applicable to South Africa, but certainly has overlaps for other parts of Africa. One finds that of the list, easily at least 25% can be attributed to the typical faculties of engineering and the built environment in the country. So, let us look at sustainability and our challenges. One could then say, to provide for sustainability, we need to widen the pipeline. 
The pipeline is however challenged at various levels. Let's just look at this at the pre-university level first. We will then examine the same at the university level. In South Africa, at the pre-university level, we find that approximately 560,000 learners partake in the National Senior Certificate Examinations. Of this, in 2013, only a third received a university exemption. If we then look at the typical numbers for mathematics and physical science, we find that the numbers reduce quickly to 14.4% being eligible for a majority of academic programs associated to engineering, engineering technology, and professions of the built environment. So to solve the pipeline problem, one could deploy additional pipes. Additional pipes could, compared to extended programs or bridging programs, or industry-developed pre-university internships. A metaphorical perspective is presented here. We need to uplift the pipe and support it. Here are some approaches that engineers or engineering technologists or engineering companies could take. The public perception to the field also limits the pipeline. The lack of role models, particularly in previously disadvantaged communities in South Africa, often means that the profession appears disconnected to what individuals strive or should strive for. Perhaps there's too much Greek here. The other issue that challenges the sustainability pipeline is whether our profession is only scarce or is it also a scarce skill. On the scarce skill notion, life at universities tend to be strenuous for engineering and engineering technology students. The Engineering Council of South Africa proposes a typical of 560 credits associated to an, a four-year academic program. Some universities do tend to exceed this. The result is, of course, the longer stay that most engineering and engineering technology students experience. Some statistics. In South Africa, if we compare those that have enrolled in engineering programs versus graduates, the throughput remains low. Fortunately, the number of enrollments has continued to rise. Comparatively, the graduation rate hasn't improved by much. Moving to a slightly different challenge, the statistics do not always hold for discipline specific. Here's some stats relating to electrical and computer engineering in the United States. A similar trend prevails in the related program in South Africa. However, one could also acknowledge that the total number of eligible students remain the same, so the decline is compensated by growth in other engineering programs, such as in civil engineering, such as in mechanical engineering. We are therefore reminded by the U.S. National Academy of Engineering that we need to do more in terms of changing the public understanding of engineering. We know that engineers can save the world. So how can we give impetus to our profession and how could this assist towards a sustainable engineering program? While it is somewhat painful and perhaps also confusing, but we do need to develop perturbations and changes in curricula. Let us take a look at this slide. The slide shows that the rate of Chinese products entering into the United States, the European Union, Asia, Japan, and possibly a similar trend in Africa has continued to increase. The trend in general shows an exponential growth. We can then argue and say, let us fight this trend. We could alternatively recognize 
that the profession is changing or perhaps needs to change. Our audience mix today is from a variety of companies, emerging or small to medium scale enterprises and also large organizations. Depending on the sector you're from, you're likely to feel in less agreement with me today. I am perhaps zooming in more to the small to medium scale sector. The scaling of this sector has the potential to create jobs in our country, on our continent. I will thus bring in the dimension of the service economy. Examples include Google, Facebook and others. One therefore finds the importance of the service sector in the industrialized economies. If one looks at the Fortune 500, there is a change, fewer manufacturers and more service companies. We could then argue that the old dichotomy between product and service is being replaced by a service product continuum. In the case of South Africa, and also countries that argue towards a knowledge-based economy for sectors relating to engineering and engineering technology, there's a resonance between the services and industrial sector. From the CIA World Factbook, we see, for instance, a stronger blue in the United States, a service economy. Parts of Africa has the agriculture green. The BRICS countries, carrying a significant population, appear to be moving towards people representing the expressed product service continuum. The one possible reaction is that service is simply way too different to engineering. Let us ignore the global trend. A more reasoned approach is however to recognize that the service economy is here to stay and let us then find ways to integrate the service economy into the engineering curricula. Let us look at a typical curricula today. Here's a sample curricula. If I asked you which program this represents, you may say electrical, fewer of you may say mechanical. If you looked at the rest, with addition of the mechanical engineering lab, it is actually a mechanical engineer, engineering second year curricula from Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. Have modules or subjects been kidnapped across disciplines? Or is this starting to represent the product service continuum that we spoke about? An interesting trend is that enrollment is not an engineering-wide problem. In fact, where engineering is wide or includes multiple disciplines, one in fact sees growth. Examples include civil engineering, mechanical engineering and others. Also, it's no longer the case that energy may reside in electrical engineering. With a different focus, one could find it elsewhere. With a heat insulation focus, the program may well reside within mechanical or even civil engineering. One possible reaction to the presence of modules in the apparently wrong appearing academic pro program is to say, let us fight the imposters. We may however have to realize that many technologies are commoditized and available even to non-engineers. The trend already exists and pre-university levels one finds kits such as the Lego Mindstorm. We saw earlier today the Kano kits being handed out by the minister. It is therefore important to build bridges between disciplines and the same then goes into the development of engineering curricula. This is one example that we are exploring as a university in the case of University of Johannesburg. In this example, we are looking at the role of engineering in a given community. 
The program is known as Engineering Projects in Community Service, or EPICS, where university students work with non-governmental organizations towards solving a problem of the non-technical community. During this approach, they also integrate an aspect of the program with secondary schools, and in this way the parties seek vertical integration or an earlier form of professional development. A typical project could be an electrification initiative. In this example, a lady near a village in Uganda accesses a cell phone charging station which also contributes to her livelihood. She can access markets for her farm produce via the mobile but also provide the charging station to others in her village for a reasonable fee. The particular initiative then enables us to contextualize engineering towards solving problems of the community or seeking a social innovation. The impetus for a third reform in engineering education is then to also acknowledge changes in the workplace. The trend where we have expected the same engineer to start and retire in a company is beginning to change. For instance, one noticed in the 2008-9 period, when unemployment rates remained low in the US, the turnover was higher. The changes then also mean that engineers and engineering technologists need more skills than before and also necessitates the need for retraining or continuing professional development. The change and introduction of the BNG Tech and its alignment to the same exit level outcomes as engineers but with a greater focus on design implementation assists in this regard. A possible reaction could be let us refine the identification of engineering work such that we can offer better protection for the working engineers. Or we could agree towards further arming our graduates and allow professional societies to continue their role with respect to continuing education and allow for an early introduction of professional networks into the university system. As I reach the end of my talk, I bring to emphasis that fundamentals are shifting. The shifts can be easily visualized as we see the role that modern computing plays today but also as we see how technology integrates with people, the case for integrating examples from the life sciences. The profession is furthermore changing with regards to geographical collaborations in relation to other disciplines, the product service continuum, but also the nature of the workplace. We also recognize that despite the role that engineers play, the economic and demographic problems remain, and thus the broadening of the profession the relationship to the domains of non-technical communities could be a further impetus. We are thus reminded that we need to adapt perhaps much more than adopt. Is this perhaps also a principle for sustainability? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the talk on sustainable engineering education. I look forward to words, questions and comments in these exciting times that we today live in. Thank you.